Welcome back to the Oxford University Scientific Society in week five of Trinity Term. Having taken a break for a week, today we resume with an interview with Dr. Irina Higgins from DeepMind. Irina is also an Oxford alumna, having completed a DPhil here on computational neuroscience. In the next hour, apart from talking about DeepMind and artificial intelligence, we'll also be touching upon careers related topics. I'll be hosting this interview alongside our Vice President Carlos. As per usual, please type your questions in the comments section and we'll try to integrate them within the interview. Okay, so if you don't mind, I will start. So mm -hmm. hello, Irina, very nice to meet you and welcome to Oxford University Scientific Society. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's, it's truly a pleasure to host you today. Um, and I think we're just gonna start with the basics. So why don't we, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and a brief introduction to what you're doing currently at DeepMind. Um, yeah, so I've been at DeepMind as a research scientist for almost six years. Uh, this was my first job after PhD at Oxford. Um, so my PhD was in computational neuroscience. My undergrad background is in psychology. So you might wonder how did I end up in AI? Um, I think I've always actually had a strong interest in the mathematical side of things. Um, so uh, I really enjoyed maths at school. Um, so actually when I went to university in, in my uh, psychology degree, uh, I think literally on the first day we were told, uh, please like, you can rejoice, there will be no maths in this degree. Um, it was actually quite, uh, scary and disappointing. So essentially, after my degree, I tried to kind of claw my way back to something more uh, more computational and more, um, yeah, something quantitative. Um, so my PhD was in computational neuroscience, which was um, trying to essentially build um, spiking neural network models of the auditory brain. Um, and then, um, uh, so after after the, during the PhD, I was wondering what career to take. I tried uh, a bunch of things. I um, thought about consulting. Tried a bunch of internships in finance, uh, and in the end, uh, a friend suggested that I try tech. And I never really thought of myself as a tech person, even though obviously I needed coding for my PhD and actually coded uh, in part time kind of jobs. I was a web web developer just for fun, um, so I kind of knew how to do it, but I didn't think that you know it was enough. I, did, I never studied computer science, um, but I did apply to Google and passed interviews. Uh, and next thing I knew, I was doing a, a, a an internship at Google Research, back to back with an internship at Goldman Sachs in, in the quant team. And it was kind of a you know very like striking contrast, um, and I guess kind of a, a nice way to make a decision about my future career. Um, so Google, to me, uh, felt like more my kind of place. Uh, and they had just acquired DeepMind, so they asked if I would be interested in interviewing with them. And um, apparently DeepMind was like the best fit I could ever think of, given <laughs> my interest in, in neuroscience and AI, um, and kind of every, essentially every, every interest that I had. Uh, so I first joined the neuroscience team. Uh, now I'm, I've changed teams to what we call frontiers. Essentially, it's like a bunch of mathematicians, physicists, and neuroscientists. Uh, and my research is on uh, unsupervised representation learning. Um, so essentially thinking about what does the brain do um, to um, you know, learn better representations of like, sensory stimuli, like you know, vision or auditory inputs. Why does any processing need to happen? Like, why is it not okay just to pass for example, you know, just retinal uh, images uh, further on. Um, and if the brain is doing something to it, like can we replicate that in algorithms um, and then give it to artificial agents so they can solve um, you know, human level tasks uh, more efficiently. Right, wow, that's a very long introduction. <laughs> I think we'll probably, um dissect a little bit more um, in the next hour to come. But just to start from the very beginning, um, so you mentioned that you started off as a cognitive psychologist or your background was in psychology. So what actually inspired you to do that like in the first place? 
Um, to be honest, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, I did um, code with my brother even in high school, and mm -hmm. he was you know very much set on going to computer science. And actually, he was the first one who went to Oxford doing computer science. Um, right. I, for some reason, did not connect I the fun coding that we're doing together with the computer science degree. To me, computer science was more about the hardware or like um, you know the big O's. I didn't necessarily think that that's what I wanted to do with my life. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, my other passion was biology, and I actually thought about uh, becoming a doctor or like a surgeon. Um, mm -hmm. At the, same, at the same time, for some reason, um, my family did not like the idea. Um, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, yeah, they were, they were a little bit uh, old-fashioned at the time. Um, and I guess they considered that as a woman, I should, um, I don't know, spend less time studying and maybe more time uh, thinking about having a family, <laughs> which is obviously very old-fashioned right now. But um, you know, I didn't know any better uh, at the time, and psychology was kind of presented as a better alternative because you don't have to study for as long, and you have better work-life balance afterwards. So essentially, I ended up uh, applying for a psychology degree, um, not really knowing what it would be about or what I would get out of it, um, and I very quickly understood that it wasn't actually uh, something I enjoyed that much. It was great in many ways. Um, but I prefer the neuroscience module, which you know was obviously just one module among many, um, and I did miss the um, kind of like the, the quantitative aspect of it. So um, yeah, that's why I decided to look elsewhere for my PhD. Right. Have you ever th thought about like being a research scientist? It would be something you wanted to do, whether it be at psychology or neuroscience or any other um, professions you wanted to pursue. Again, so. Science wasn't really on my radar at all. Uh, I guess it, it you know, I, I come from a quite small village in Russia. So um, I don't have any example like role models who were scientists. I didn't, like obviously I knew that science existed, but I didn't, it was just like never an option. So um, no, I, um, I thought essentially I would, I would get my degree and get a job, uh, potentially working like a, a psychologist in, in a business somewhere. Right, right. That's probably quite different from where you actually ended up then. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was wondering, like, did you explore any other options, as you mentioned earlier, apart from psychology, apart from what you're currently working in? Anything else that, in, that caught your eye in, on the way? Or um, So for me, um, as I said, you know, I, I knew I didn't, like after I started my degree, psychology wasn't for me. So mm -hmm. then I knew I had to do kind of another step of education. Um, and uh, Essentially, you know, I was kind of like doing greedy optimization at every point. So, you know, there was an opportunity during my second year to take a, a kind of a, almost a gap year from my degree and mm -hmm. like go and work somewhere. So it was kind of a program that my university organized. So, um, and you could essentially you could pick from the options that they, they offered or you could find your own. Uh, and given that my brother was already at Oxford and he had this like second year, you know, living out of college thing, uh, I thought, well, it wouldn't it be great if we lived together? And if, you know, <laughs> well, some people might disagree with you on that, but <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So essentially, I kind of um, I looked through the lab names uh, at Oxford and found um, a lab called uh, Oxford Center for Computational Neuroscience and Artificial Intelligence, which just sounded very cool to me. Um, and I thought, yeah, I'll just reach out and see what happens. And of course, like the first email. I got a uh, kind of resound no, like we don't take undergrads. Uh, this is kind of not something that's going to happen. Um, but I kind of tried to explain that, like, maybe you will reconsider, like, I, and maybe I'm a kind of special case. I can, like, you know, maybe I can talk and, and prove something to you. So uh, the supervisor, Simon Stringer, was actually really nice. And he actually did give me a chance. He invited me for an interview. And evidently, you know, I did something right. So he invited me to come for that second year. And you know, once I've um, spent the year with the lab, actually we ended up writing a paper based on the research that was I was involved in. Um, you know, Simon suggested I stay for my third year project with the lab that also results in the paper. So then I was like, well, you know, it kind of seems like PhD is natural uh, from here. So I applied to stay with the lab from PhD and uh, 
that was it. Uh, but, the, sorry, right, your question was about the, options. Within the same research group? Yes, essentially I stayed with, um, with the same group uh, for my PhD, but I kind of changed topics. Um, and then when I started my PhD, now the question was like, do I want to stay in academia or do I want to do something else? Uh, obviously, you know, academia was an option, like kind of a natural next step, um, but I wanted to see what else was out there. Um, so I kind of like did some research, which jobs actually, you know, benefit from having a quantitative PhD. And it seemed like you know, quant jobs in finance was something that, you know, actually required a PhD. So I started applying to internships. Uh, and as I said, like I, I did actually three. Um, so I did the Deutsche Bank first, then a small asset management company, uh, and then Goldman. So I felt like, you know, I, I've experienced quite a spectrum there. And it was, you know, it was great. I loved my first internship. But then, you know, after the second and third, I found that maybe like, I essentially ended up doing the same project over and over again because it worked in the first place. And they kind of, once they learned about it, they wanted to repeat it. And then it became just like moving between different groups and doing the same thing for them. Um, and just didn't feel like I would be learning that much or kind of would have opportunity to improve like my, my machine learning skills or um, like math skills or anything like that. Uh, whereas at Google, it felt uh almost the other way around like i arrived and it was all about just you know take every learning opportunity you can the interaction project is great but like don't obsess about it actually you know have fun talk to people um so this is why i kind of i thought that uh it seemed more of a uh, more opportunity for growth then right uh, actually can i you mind if i ask a question so mm -hmm. from from the outside it feels like you've been sort of switching fields all along the way, right? Like you started with psychology, you move into more sort of quantitative computational neuroscience, did a few sort of, well, actually almost a year, right? In, in finance, right? things that are like quite different from the sort of things you do in computational neuroscience. And then you moved on to, to DeepMind. So how, how, how have you managed to go from field to field so quickly and in so many cases? What, what have you learned from that? Was it difficult? Um, it was difficult, yeah, I wouldn't lie, especially, you know, coming to computational neuroscience from quite a few years, well, I think it was two or three years, having, like, not touched math at all. I've realized that I'd forgotten, like, literally everything. Um, so for quite a few years, my life was about, you know, self-studying, like, literally, uh, I think MOOCs and, like, all this, like, Khan Academy was just starting at the time, so I would, you know, uh, load up on lectures there and like, go to the library, uh, try to kind of um, do some like mini projects, uh, kind of like hobby projects uh, on my own and learn through that with friends. So for example, my lab mate uh, and I, we decided to build a poker AI. So um, that was literally just to learn some like machine learning basics. Um, so yeah, it's kind of like a fun project to, to do. Uh, and actually I learned enough machine learning through that to then apply it in like in finance. That sounds like quite a difficult project to start making a uh, poker play in AI. That's quite impressive. <clears throat> well, to be honest, it was mostly about data collection and having all the lot of hours online playing. Do you reckon that, because um, you mentioned that you actually started coding really early on and your brother was already um, quite proficient in using programming languages. Do you reckon that really helped you in the beginning or um, would it have been e equally as easy if you had just someone who was completely new to the subject just kind of picked it up in their default? I think it definitely helped. I think I essentially through just watching my brother in the early days and then like slowly picking up myself, I learned how to think programmatically. I think once you learn that, then like picking up a new language doesn't take any time. You can literally just Google the syntax as long as you know what you want to express. Um, so I actually never found coding hard. Or like I can't claim that I'm you know an excellent engineer. I probably won't be able to optimize uh, the code as well as you know somebody with much more experience and kind of a relevant degree. Um, but you know I. I never struggle to implement something I want to implement. Actually, I think this is the perfect opportunity to uh, come up with a question from the audience. So Nina Kruklikova, she's asking where you did your first degree and if you feel that that background in, in psychology was actually helpful or harmful 
to your research and career ambitions. I, I assume she's probably referring to well the fact that you are now doing a highly quantitative work and you had three years where you had no math. Um, so my degree was at Westminster University in London and it's both helpful and not helpful. So for example, when I was applying for finance jobs, people were asking me like, why finance given your background? Um, even when I was doing, uh, well, even when I was applying for, for my PhD, you know, people were asking like, well, it's very computational, where's your evidence that you actually can do this kind of work? Um, but at the same time, in my current job, it's actually very helpful because, you know, obviously building AGI is hard. We don't know how to do it. And it's very like ill constrained. Um, so what we end up doing is, is kind of trying to bring inspiration from all sorts of places. And obviously humans are the only working example of, of, of general intelligence that we kind of want to replicate. So kind of thinking about what makes humans say like uh, thinking about developmental psychology, like how do babies acquire better intelligence or kind of uh, cognitive science or kind of at a high level, how, how does, uh, how do humans behave? Obviously neuroscience comes in. Uh, so yeah, I think these, this kind of background makes you think maybe a little bit differently from uh, somebody who is like hardcore computer scientist or mathematician, uh, which is just very complementary. Okay. What do you think? Oh, yeah, no, fair no, enough. Go ahead, Lena. <laughs> what do you think about like having such a like multidisciplinary aspects in your career? Is something that's typical of people from you know that you work with, or is it something that everyone somehow learns to pick up on the way? Um, it's a good question. At DeepMind, I think it's, it's kind of a, a special and unique environment. Mm -hmm. uh, so Demis Hassabis uh, is himself a kind of a polymath. Obviously, you know, he did his PhD in neuroscience. He's like you know, chess games prodigy and like he's you know, good at everything. Um, and I think when he was assembling the team, kind of like multidisciplinarity was important to him. So, you know, as I said, we have a dedicated neuroscience team with a lot of people kind of with similar backgrounds uh, mm -hmm. to me. Uh, Frontiers team is, is like this, you know, melting pot of literally like, as I said, like any kind of background, mathematicians, physicists, um, uh, we have like, you know, computational biologists, like all sorts of backgrounds. Um, we, and we are trying to kind of ever increase that diversity because it feels like it's super important for what we do. And I found even in my personal job, for example, I don't have background in physics, but as my research evolved, I actually realized that I needed to understand physics because, you know, it constrains the evolution of intelligence and kind of the, the nature of tasks that intelligence has to solve. So if I want to think about like what inductive biases to put in the models, like how to structure them, how to shape them, I really need to understand physics. Uh, like, you know, in DeepMind you have a lot of physicists, so you can kind of get pointers and learn much faster than you would on your own. But yeah, I kind of spent last year learning uh, the relevant parts of physics and trying to integrate it in my, in my work. Okay, so it sounds like a great opportunity to, to start talking a little bit more about DeepMind. Um, so when you joined DeepMind, uh, was it six years ago, if I am correct, like around 2015? Mm -hmm. So it was it was a smaller company than it's, it is today. So how how was it and how has it changed since you joined? So when I joined, I was like M318, I think. It was yeah, pretty tiny. I remember we, uh, we had a small office and it still wasn't kind of fully occupied and you knew everyone. You know, we would have monthly socials with the whole company. So it felt very much like a family. Uh, now we are like, I would say around a thousand people. Uh, so obviously a very, very different dynamic. Um, and it was interesting to kind of like be there as the company grew and as the dynamic changed. Um, I would say there were some moments when, you know, we had growth pains where, you know, when it's a hundred people, you can literally go, you know, like, okay, this person knows this question, like that's answer this question, just go and ask. Whereas now it kind of becomes harder. You have to like put processes in place. You have to actually like systematize things. So um, it, I would say it doesn't, like obviously it doesn't feel the same, but somehow they did manage to keep maybe like the, the core of the culture intact. So it still feels like incredibly friendly and like literally anyone you talk to, 
is your immediate friends. Um, and yeah, it's very much very stimulating, you know, academically and in terms of like you have all these amazing people um, interested in very similar things to you and working on kind of very related pro problems. So uh, you know, you, you always can have an interesting conversation. So tell us a bit more about the culture. So what's in deep mind? What what is it the culture that like really appeals to you beyond beyond what you has have told us, and why? In which sense is it? unique be different to like other companies that do similar things or like to the main sort of google uh culture that is also like very well similar to what you have described yeah so i think the main difference for me even between google and DeepMind, is google still feels kind of hierarchical whereas a deep mind you know you'll have a friday drinks and you know demons will hang out and literally everyone if you're an intern or um like, I don't know, even if you're a guest of another deep mind, you're welcome to come and you know, ask questions and things will happily talk to you. Um, we also have like a lot of intellectual freedom. Again, at Google, they have quite uh, strict projects like OKRs, they call them like every six months, the team has to deliver, it has to be obviously like related to a product. So you kind of, it, Often you can't really decide exactly what you'll do yourself because you have to prioritize the team's uh, goals. Whereas in all my six years at DeepMind, no one has ever told me what to do. Uh, you know, if you, it's also very egalitarian. So you know, you, you can you know be in the company for a few months if you have a great idea and you're willing to like uh, talk about it and you know, lead it. Uh, and other people are interested in joining, then you, know, you become a, a project lead and you can have, I don't know, five, 10 people working with you on, on kind of your idea. So um, yeah, I think this, these are kind of the main things that intellectual intellectual freedom, you have the ability to like take, you know, as much time as you want, like you could take a month off, for example, just to go and read off some physics textbooks and no one will ask any questions because they know that you'll come back and then you'll write like this great new paper uh, that you wouldn't have written otherwise. So what do you reckon keeps it all together, you know? I mean, it's all great and good that everyone has the chance to explore whatever areas they wanted, but there ultimately has to be some sort of a purpose or some sort, sort of an output, right? Uh, no, so individually, you know, you're, you're judged on your impact, whether it's internal or external. So external impact could be like in any, any scientific career, it's, you know, uh, how many times you get cited, how many talks you give outside, and, you know, your involvement in the in the community, the broader scientific community. Uh, internally, it could be like maybe you've written this amazing code base that you know everyone is relying on, or you've optimized something, or you know you, you have developed some sort of uh, algorithm or, or idea that has changed the thinking of many people. Um, so it doesn't even need to be published at that point. Um, so yeah, so you're measured on that, and, and of course, you know your timelines are your own. So you might take like nine months off to do some like soul searching and thinking, and then you come back in the next three months, you write a paper. And it's actually it changes Dennis's perspective on AGI, right? So obviously that's a huge impact, and that will be recognized. So how does how does it actually feel to work there in? What do you do on a normal day? Like, do you, is there a routine, or does it really depend? Do you mostly write code? Do you mostly think? Yeah, I think uh, it's like uh, in any academic career, time goes in phases. Uh, but maybe like a standard one is you come up with like broad research idea. You probably do like a lot of literature search and like reading, talking to people, trying to like you know figure out. Is it a good idea? How should you reframe it and really like specialize? Uh, maybe like during that process, you find people who are also interested, maybe like build a team around it. Uh, then yeah, it's, it's all about the execution. So you try to kind of develop this new uh, agent or kind of new, new theory. Uh, obviously it takes trial and error until something actually works. And then it's, uh, it's about writing it up. So you, know, you, you race to a conference deadline or you submit to a journal. Uh, you write it, then you go and present. You know, you do like maybe a tour of, of invited talks. 
Um, and then you have rinse and repeat. So that was like broadly speaking, that's a bit. Sorry, I was muted. So, <laughs> no worries. Sorry about that. Um, so, in particular, I am conscious that well, DeepMind is quite protective of its IP, but could you perhaps give us a little bit more detail in what you do? You've mentioned unsupervised uh, knowledge representation, but is there, well, could you give us some details on what specific parts of that field you're working on? Yeah. So, if you think about vision, so I primarily work with vision just because both in your science we know a lot about the visual system and you know images are kind of like a very popular domain to work on uh in ai <clears throat> so if you think about the visual brain um you know obviously we kind of get our uh perception of the world through the retina and actually what we know is that that's all the information we'll ever get right you can't add information through processing you can only lose it so uh but we also know that there is a bunch of cortical processing afterwards where some learning is happening, the representation is kind of uh, getting low dimensional. And the question is like, what's going on? Like, what's the purpose of it? And what's the output? Um, and kind of a strong hypothesis, both in neuroscience and AI, is that what we want is we want to kind of lose information that's not relevant to the task. So typically, the task is seen as like object recognition. So this is a cat or a dog. And maybe things that you're not interested uh, to do this task is like uh, what color is the, do the dog or where it is uh, or like well, what's happening in the background uh, and that's kind of what um, a lot of the uh, you may have heard like the image classifiers um, these like deep neural networks that take an image and then they tell you like what breed of dog it is or like um, what object it is and they actually can do it better than humans now um, so this is kind of what was the status quo um, in machine learning for a very long time. But then you think about it uh, from um, kind of like artificial agent uh, perspective, where maybe actually the agent needs to solve other kinds of tasks. Like it, it's involved, it's in the world, it needs to act. And maybe actually for this agent to survive, it needs to differentiate between different colored dogs, right? Or maybe it needs to know what's happening in the background. And if, it, if you just give this agent uh, a visual system that discards all that information that's pre-training on this classification task, you know, the agent is essentially blind to a lot of these variations, and that's not great. So uh, the question then becomes like, how can you learn vision that's better for many, many more tasks, not just one? And especially if you don't know what the tasks will be in advance. Uh, and this is where kind of my work comes in, and we talk about something called disentanglement, where and broadly speaking, uh, we'll say, well, you know, if you wanted to create a 3D world like ours, how would you do it? You would probably specify, okay, uh, this is going to be like three objects. Uh, one will be small, uh, kind of maybe blue, and it will be like on the left, so the other one will be large, etc. cetera. Uh, so essentially, you know, even as I'm describing this, there are very few words that describe kind of the basics of the scene. Uh, and there are very few properties, like you describe maybe the position, the color, the number of the object, the shape of the object. So uh, the idea is that maybe we can kind of invert this and have a model that looks at a bunch of pictures of 3D scenes and then learns a representation where uh, kind of one dimension in that representation will encode everything to do with the position of an object, another one will encode everything to do with shape and color. <clears throat> and so essentially we disentangle kind of these important properties of objects into different subspaces in a representation. So, it's low dimensional, so we'll lose a lot of kind of irrelevant detail. Uh, so we don't use as many kind of like dimensions as like the pixel space. But at the same time, we keep the important bits. So then when a task, task comes and the task is like, what, what color is the object? You actually have that information and it's very readily accessible. Um, so that's kind of my work. So uh, I developed the first algorithm that could do that without any access to the ground truth, so without any supervision by just like looking at the images. Uh, and then later work connected this idea like, okay, so what are these dimensions? Where do they come from? And why should we, uh, like, why should the model discover that? Uh, we connected that to the idea of symmetries from physics, kind of the idea of, of uh, transformations which commute with each other, and kind of how also kind of in physics, symmetries are connected to the idea of conserved quantities. 
and essentially conserve quantities are like the cores of the world, like the objects, the entities. So in effect, by learning a representation that reflects the symmetries of the world, we also discover kind of the, the objects and the entities of the world. And these things kind of give us this, essentially that's what tasks are all about. It's about manipulating the entities in the world. I see. So, so I, I have the intuition that you will be using your your sort of psychology understanding of how the brain works to design better networks. But it feels like you are just using the inherent well, symmetries in the laws of physics to design your things. That's super interesting. So, uh, can you give us an example of how that technology has been used in DeepMind to do other more well applied things? Yeah. So, um, the, the whole idea was to kind of do this representation learning to make artificial agents more efficient and kind of better generalization. And, uh, you know, we have shown that, for example, you know, you can do this very simple test for uh, artificial agents. For example, you teach it to collect uh, like apples and ignore lemons, right? Apples are good, lemons are bad. Uh, and maybe that's kind of, you teach it in a green room and then you go to a blue room and in the blue room you have like strawberries and um, I don't know, uh, limes, uh, right? Uh, and now, like, strawberries are good. Uh, so the agent knows that it has seen both rooms, it has seen both objects, but now you switch the objects around. So now, uh, so apples are in the blue room and strawberries are in the whatever the other room. Uh, and you would think that the agent would just, you know, still do the right thing. But actually, uh, the naive agents, which don't have the kind of vision that, you know, my models give it, you know, all that information about the room and the objects is kind of entangled in a one big mess in the model and actually the agent uh, struggles. So now strawberry in a different color room is not the same strawberry as, as was before. So it doesn't actually know what to do. Whereas uh, with the disentangled vision that my model gives it, you know, it's all in different kinds of spaces, subspaces for your representation. So essentially the agent's policy, you know, still works really well. So we show that, you know, this kind of transfer between uh, different environments um, is significantly better. Um, we've also applied it recently to uh, EEG analysis. So here it's, uh, you know, you just have raw EEG and um, you know that some, pe some people who uh, this kind of recording is coming from had depression, others didn't. Uh, so the question is, can you train some representation from the raw EEG data that will kind of recover the biomarker of depression? without knowing who is who. And we show that again, you know, it was able to do that. And it was able to kind of just find uh, this known, kind of one known biomarker of depression, and then kind of like we could identify what it was. And it was all very interpretable. And it means that, you know, it can actually be used as a tool to discover uh, new biomarkers of kind of other conditions. Well, that is super interesting. Really, really cool application and technology as well. Um, so. I well, I'm conscious of time, so then I'm gonna start. Let's wrap up the topic about the mind, so we can move on to some of the topics. So I'm gonna ask my last question here, which is, we've covered, uh, we've touched on it a little bit, but I, I just want to ask it anyway. Which is, what do you recognize are the main differences between working in in academia, also within a public research institution, and working in the private industry as a researcher, and uh, potentially for our our speaker and actually. To be honest, for myself, um, what would you, what factors do you think one should consider between the side and between the two? So I think there are, there are obviously differences between different scientific fields. So I can only comment really uh, on neuroscience and uh, kind of AI machine learning. Um, so one thing I found with the academia and, and neuroscience in particular was, you know, the pace of work was quite slow, um, and also at least in my experience, it was quite isolating. I found that, you know, you publish in journals, you hardly ever see the other people who work on similar topics. The only feedback you kind of get is that you, you, somebody cites you, but you know, if you're in a niche setting, uh, you know, it's, it's not gonna happen that often. Um, so essentially kind of like almost, you know, shout into um, kind of abyss, whereas, uh, in machine learning and especially in the academic setting, it's very much more fast-paced. Uh, you know, there are three conferences, like main 
machine learning conferences a year. And potentially, you could have papers submitted to all three of them. Uh, yeah, I've done that. It's, yeah. Um, you, so it's, yeah. So essentially, you kind of like iterate over projects very, very quickly. You get immediate feedback. Um, so DeepMind, obviously, yeah, everyone works on kind of like with the same goal in mind. So internally, you get immediate feedback. Externally, also, you know, once you present at the conference, you kind of have a lively poster session. Uh, typically, you know, people will want to chat afterwards or kind of build collaborations. So um, I just find that in in, in the industry, uh, it's it's much more lively, much more fast paced, and maybe much more interactive. Uh, plus, you also get a lot of support that you wouldn't get in academia. Like, you know, at DeepMind, you have scientists, but you also have engineers. Um, you have kind of projects and program managers. Uh, you have like incredible support from, let's say, like the travel team. So if you want to go to a conference, you know, uh, they'll help you book everything. Uh, so <laughs> sometimes it kind of gets to the ridiculous point where, uh, you know, we get an email saying, like, please remember to pack your passport because people get so kind of like used to everything is being done for them that they even forget these like small details. Wow, that sounds quite a dream life here. Um, is there anything that you think that the academia offers that the industry doesn't? Um, again, so DeepMind feels like a special environment because That's it's very true. academic. But I know that in other uh, industry scientific labs, you perhaps can get uh, more pressure to kind of you know, do something useful for the company. So kind of more maybe product focused. So maybe you wouldn't get as much research freedom as you would in academia. And maybe not as much, uh, well, like obviously, once you have tenure, you have much more security and you can kind of like go and then investigate, you know, potentially much more open ended questions, kind of more, much more ambitious research questions. I feel like this, this is not actually a differentiation with DeepMind because, as I said, it, it is very, uh, you do have all the intellectual freedom you want at DeepMind. Well, it seems that DeepMind's model is working. Um, do you do you think you will ever go to a different job, or currently that's not you're you're very happy with the current um, work life balance or um, the kind of tasks you do? Yeah, no, so I think you know you always look out for something else and you kind of wonder. But so far, I have not seen any other opportunities, and I can't even think of another opportunity that would make me essentially which will match what DeepMind has. Uh, you know not even talking about getting, giving me something better than what mine is. As I said, like, you know, you do have the intellectual freedom and the support, uh, and you can like, you know, work in, you, know, you can take some time off to think, and no one will say anything, or you can come back and work, I don't know, uh, 12 hour days and, and be super productive. And again, you know, it's, it's your choice. Um, and you can, because you work on the things that actually interest you, uh, it doesn't feel like work. Right. Have you seen anyone around you that um, doesn't enjoy the kind of lifestyle? And if so, well, for what reason? Uh, I think burnout is a thing at deep point, but it's not, as I said, like nothing is really forced. So it's just, you know, people get too excited and they kind of uh, maybe work a little bit too hard. And I think, you know, at Oxford, like, you know the feeling like sometimes you just want to <laughs> want to do a bit more. Um, and I think, yeah, I think in DeepMind we also, I would say, you know, a lot of people are kind of high achievers and very competitive. So there is a bit of this internal feel like, oh, but if I don't do this, then somebody else will probably get ahead, like, and, and have, a, I don't know, faster career or whatever. And uh, maybe that, that puts a little bit more pressure on you. Right. Well, I think so far we can definitely say that the pros outweighs the cons. So um, I think we'll probably wrap up the DeepMind section here, Carlos, unless you have anything else to add. No? OK, we'll probably move on, because we, we do only have 15, 20 minutes left. Um, and audience members, please do post questions um, so you can integrate them in the chat in our interview. Um, we, you, hopefully, we won't be able to miss anyone. But um, let's move on. And this is going to be the last section where we talk about just a general um, outlook about the industry, about just other things that some pick up on some loose threads. What do you see as the next breakthrough or the next few breakthroughs in the tech industry in the coming 10 years? Um, okay, 10 years is a long time. 
and sure. five <laughs> years, whatever in the future. <laughs> yeah. Next six months. Um, so okay, six months <laughs> is also a bit short. But uh, I don't know if you you're familiar with uh, the big large language models that you know have been very popular recently, and like GPT three and all of that. I think you know that was kind of one of the biggest qualitative shifts in AI recently. And I think we're still kind of as a, as a as a field we're still processing exactly what it means. Um, so I think. Maybe for the next couple of years, it will probably be kind of like incremental changes in that direction, just kind of making these models more robust and maybe kind of make them do uh, things like other things than just kind of you know generating mm, kind of cool sounding language, but maybe without that much purpose. Um, so I think you know giving them more um, well, first of all, like you making them multimodal, so that, for example, they can understand images as well as uh, kind of language prompts, uh, making them more stable so that they don't kind of contradict themselves. If you sample kind of many different, um, kind of ask them questions about the same topic, but often they, they kind of just, you know, it's essentially what, what language models are now is like a thousand people in one. So when you ask it a question, you don't know which person will answer it and obviously, you know, the different people will have different opinions. So you, you get kind of like very consistent results. So I think making them uh, kind of like one person so that they have the memory of what they've already said and kind of an opinion that they can kind of continuously um, uh, talk about uh, when they're talking to you, I think that, that that's another important thing. But in terms of what we actually kind of need going forward, I think what we need is something that can like really reason, like the way humans do that. I don't know if you're familiar with like system one, system two distinction uh, that uh, it comes, well, Daniel Kahneman made it uh, popular in his thinking uh, fast and slow book. Uh, but this distinction kind of comes uh, across in many different fields. There's always like one system that's quite uh, intuitive, kind of associative, um, it's fast. So for example, like it's very much like uh, you, you give it uh, some input, it immediately produces a response. And it's kind of like how maybe animals act, uh, kind of how humans intuitively act. And that's kind of, yeah, that's, that's the system that humans actually use the most. But system two is, is something different. It's like this slow, deliberative, conscious uh, kind of processing that requires a lot of resources. Um, so for example, like working memory uh, in humans. And that's something that, you know, it's very, uh, expensive to use, so even humans kind of often don't use it. But that's what essentially we need to to make like scientific discoveries or to kind of think out of the box and kind of create new knowledge. And I think that's something that uh, our algorithms are nowhere near. Uh, and I think that's what the original AI was about, kind of this whole symbolic AI, kind of introducing logic to these models. Um, so kind of the dream was there 50 years ago, but essentially it just proved too hard to systematize kind of the world knowledge and kind of, uh, you know, actually use formal logic over it. Uh, so kind of people gave up on that and then like deep learning came about and it's like such a great thing to implement this system one, like the associative fast kind of thinking. Um, the question is now, can we take that technology, deep learning, and try to somehow make it do slower system two reasoning as well. So what do you reckon is the main obstacle then? Um, is there something that if conquered would enable us to do much more or much better? Um, well, I think, I think yeah, this kind of reasoning is the, the obstacle. Uh, how to conquer it, I think no one really knows. Uh, people are trying kind of using deep learning as a uh, front end to the old fashioned kind of like symbolic AI. People are trying to do it uh, end to end, but it's it's a very hard problem. And I think few people work on it right now, um, but it can be kind of revolutionary and, and very impactful. I think we'll probably pick up um, one of the audience members' questions. Carlos, would you mind reading it out? Because um, I feel like it's probably more your thing than my thing. So. <laughs> Wow, this is a massively specific question, but that's yeah. right. So this is uh, one of the fans of your papers, so the Vita Variation Allot and Code paper, is asking, what potential do you see in disentanglement beyond interpretability? 
Um, and then he claims a new work from Google show that it's not that useful for downstream tasks, which you may or may not want to comment. Um, so I'm not sure what exactly this work is. I know there was a paper from, I think, two years ago now uh, from Zurich, uh, from Francesco Locatelli. Is that, I don't know if we can interact. Um, but I think that was probably the most, like the biggest splash in that area that kind of show that it's not so useful, but actually then the same group publish more papers that show that, that it is in fact useful. Um, so um, I think there's yeah there's enough evidence, there's not enough enough kind of pieces of work that show that it is useful. The question is um, essentially in, in the paper that I'm referring to, they had some issues with how they measured um, this entanglement and the tasks that they were trying to solve. So um, yeah, I think this is a very specific conversation. So if you if you want more detailed answer, please send me an email and I'll try to answer that. Fair enough, fair enough. We don't often get enthusiastic fans on the audience, but um, that's that's refreshing, I guess. Um, right, we'll continue our um, previous conversation about um, you know just the general outlook about tech. Um, what what would you say are some good practices that encourages innovation in science or in whatever area, specific area you work in? Um, so do you, yeah, do you, to, in, to, um, what would be some good practice or some rules or um, some good environment to encourage innovation? So that's, that's a good question. I think actually allowing people freedom to take time off and really think deeply about things is important. Uh, I find even with my own work, like once you have a few projects rolling, you always have something that you kind of immediate for one of the projects that you need to do. And then it kind of like becomes this race, like you're just juggling many different things. And essentially you end up paying quite little attention to anything in particular. Um, and you make progress, but it's very much surface level. Like you essentially you're not using your system too there. Right? You're not doing deep reasoning. Um, so I think sometimes you need this time to like, just put everything on hold, take, a day or you know if if you can maybe in a week or a couple of weeks and really think about what are you trying to solve why uh you know read uh more broadly kind of expand your um your horizon like you know just have random discussions with your peers um so actually that's one thing that i, I miss from uh working in the office that you don't just you know, we don't have this random social encounters. You don't just like bump into somebody at the coffee machine and uh, you know st start talking about something inconsequential and then it turns into some, like crazy thought and that becomes like a project. Um, you know, we also used to have team retreats where we would all go away to you know some hotel in the countryside for a week, and uh, there will be a lot of like team bonding experience, but also brainstorming sessions and just like, again, just natural interactions in a relaxed uh, environment always, always lead to kind of brainstorms, uh, kind of good ideas. So yeah, I think something like that is probably the main thing that at least for me helps. Well, um, I'm gonna just take the opportunity to ask you what I think has to be our last question in terms of timings. Um, and I think this is going to be a very classic question, but still very important for our audience, which is, um, so if you had to give one piece of advice to everyone here that wants to, or someone here that wants to take a career in technology, be it in a sort of more research branch like you're doing or a sort of more classical tech career, what would your advice be? So I think, so, it's kind of hard to give a general piece of advice for everyone because you know there, there are different companies with different requirements. But if you want to work somewhere like DeepMind or even like I would say, you know, a, any big like AI lab or kind of creative um, job like that, then I think what we really value is seeing that somebody is actually passionate about these kind of things. Um, you know, people often come and they would say, oh, I studied machine learning in my master's or I, uh, I don't know, went to this conference, but I think what, if you actually were interested in this, you probably would have already coded the model because there are, there are so many uh, online resources available. Uh, you probably would have like um, 
you know, created something, even if it's simple, uh, but you would have had your hands there too by now. Uh, so I think having kind of like hobby projects to do with what you actually want to do as your job uh, is super useful because you have something to demonstrate that you're actually passionate about it. And, you know, once you start doing this yourself, where it's like practical experience rather than just theoretical experience, you know, you just, you like, you talk much better about it. And, you, you know, you can always sense in an interview that, you know, this person has actually done it themselves. Um, and I guess another piece of advice is if you can, go to uh, kind of big machine learning conference. There, There's a new rips that's coming up uh, in December, ICML or iClear. Um, so this is kind of a great way to immerse yourself in this world and you know, just going to post the sessions, talking to people, listening to the keynotes helps you again, like understand what's the landscape like, what are the big problems, what are people interested in, and also kind of be able to speak the language uh, better. Right, I think that's probably going to be the last question and we'll draw this interview to a close. Um, Irina, thank you ever so much for giving up your time to be here today. I hope our audience have taken away something useful in the last hour. Um, thank you everyone in the audience as well for being here, um, as well as all the committee members who uh, managed to put effort into this to make it possible. We look forward to seeing you again this Thursday where um, we have invited Mr. Herbert Swanaker from Clifford Charles to talk, to talk about the implications of advanced technology in the practice of law. So with that, I think this is going to be the last sentence or a few sentences of this interview. Um, could you uh, have a lovely evening? Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me.